Well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, it is a pleasure for us to be here and spend some time with you this afternoon. So we're going to open with the question that's probably on all of your minds is, where's Mrs. White? Who are these three folks sitting in front of us this <laughs> afternoon? So I want to say, um, unfortunately, Mrs. White, our superintendent, wasn't able to join us um, this afternoon for the student town hall. Um, but she wanted you to know um, she's attending to some family um, business that she has to attend to today. And for you to understand that that's the only thing that really would ever pull her away from spending time with kids um, is, is something that has to deal really with, with her family. So please know that her heart and spirit and mind are here. Um, and certainly she's going to be, if not watching this live, going to be watching this um, when she's able to watch it and know that it was important for her to make sure that your voice continues to be heard. There is nothing more important to our superintendent than listening to you. Whether that's in your classroom, um, I'm sure many of you have seen her walking your buildings over the years, um, so she does that because that's where her heart is. She was a teacher. She always still considers herself a teacher first. Um, so because of that, there's no place you'd rather be than spending time with kids, whether you're five-year-old in kindergarten or three-year-old in pre-K, all the way to 17 and 18 in high school. So we are here. She asked us to be here on her behalf. So my name is George Roberts. I serve as the community superintendent for the East Zone schools here in Baltimore County. And I'm here with my two colleagues who will introduce themselves to you. Good afternoon. I'm Christina Byers, and I'm the community superintendent for the Central Zone. And I'm glad that I get to be with you this afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm Raquel Jones, the community superintendent for the West Zone. And I'm delighted to be here as well. So <clears throat> you weren't able to get here without teachers um, who took time out of their day to support you in getting here. So before we get into some introductory comments and really why we're here to hear your questions, we want to, th if we could take a minute to thank your teachers um, and principals who came out to support you. Mrs. White wants to make sure um, before we field your questions that there are two things that she wants you to understand. And you've heard this before. If you've ever heard Mrs. White speak, whether in person or on TV or at board meetings, she really focuses on two things and keeps those two things front and center in her vision for Baltimore County Public Schools and in, in front and center with us as her staff and her team members and with all the adults who work with you. First is literacy. Um, she has, again, I mentioned she was a teacher and is a teacher. So literacy is critically important to her. And what does literacy mean? At its most basic level, it's reading, it's writing, it's being able to communicate what you're reading and writing. But really at a more complex level, it's all the different subjects that you take during your school day. Science and social studies, physical education, music, you name it. All the things that you do. Take that and add it to all the information you're exposed to on a daily basis on your cell phones, on your computers at home, everywhere that you get billboards, newspapers, everywhere that you get information from, how do you process all of that? How do you use that information that you're constantly being bombarded with and that you're learning in school? And then how do you make informed decisions around that? How do you translate that into an essay? How do you translate that into standing up and maybe giving a speech in front of your classes? How do you translate that into questions you're about to ask us? So all of these questions that you've been writing and focusing on and you're going to share with us come from taking a lot of information and saying, this is what's important to me. This is what I want to hear addressed by the superintendent and by her team. And this is what I want to share. That's literacy. That's an example of literacy. It's certainly a lot more involved and a lot deeper than that. But really, for our purposes here, that's what we're talking about. So as you're learning and as you're processing and as you're able to communicate information, are you doing that in the second priority of hers around climate? Are you doing that in a schoolhouse that when you walk into every day, a couple of things are happening? Do you feel welcomed in that space? Do you feel safe in that space? Is there a person or are there persons that each and every one of you could go to if I would ask you to close your eyes and think, is there a person in your school, any adult in your school that you could go to with a problem, with a question? Um, maybe you just need someone to listen. Maybe you just need an adult to sit and listen. You're saying, hey, look, I don't need advice. I just want you to hear what's going on in my world right now. Do you have that adult or adults in your school that you can do that with? And a lot of you are nodding your heads. That's perfect. 
and that's great. And that's what she wants for every single one of you. And that's what she wants for all 114,000 students in Baltimore County Public Schools. So with those two priorities, the goal is obviously for you guys to graduate, okay? And anywhere from four to six or seven years, depending if you're a sixth, seventh, or eighth grader. So when you graduate from high school, you're gonna walk across the stage and get a diploma. And it's gonna come in a nice hardcover bound, it's gonna have your diploma and you're, and you're across the stage. But what does that diploma mean to you? Well, it means a lot to a lot of different people. What the superintendent really wants to make sure when she talks about literacy and climate is what's underneath that diploma. She calls that a gift with purchase. So what extra are you getting? So you're gonna come across the stage and get that piece of paper in that nice leather case, but what else? What skills, what literacy skills are you gonna have that are gonna translate when you get to the bottom of those steps and you move on to the next phase of your life? What are you gonna be able to fall back on? For some of you, that might be culinary arts. If you go to a magnet school, it might be dance, it might be singing, it might be construction trades, it might be AP capstone certification, it might be an IB diploma, it might be dual language or tri-language certification as you've gone through and you've learned two to three or more languages. There's a lot of different options for you all, a lot of different opportunities that you have. So it's critical for the superintendent that you understand that the future is bright, the future is wide open for each and every one of you. And through literacy, in a climate that's conducive for your learning, that's what's gonna allow you to walk across that stage, not just for that diploma, but for what that diploma means, which are the skills and your ability to enter into the next phase of your life and be productive citizens, which is ultimately the goal of all of us as educators. So around the room are not just your teachers, but also members of the superintendent's cabinet, and really a, a, that's a fancy term for the superintendent's team. So the superintendent has a team of folks that are surrounding you as well, that their job is to make sure that you're supported in every single way. We work with principals in schools on a daily basis, but there's an entire team of people that wrap their arms around you every single day to make sure that you're getting those literacy skills, but you're also in an environment that allows you to learn and, and reach your pinnacle of success. So with that, um, we're gonna open the floor to questions. We're gonna kind of bounce between our right and, and our left. Um, we'll kind of go kind of from front to back, front to back, and in the middle. So um, invariably, if there are questions that you're not able to ask because of time, then we certainly can stay after. And there's other team members here from the superintendent's cabinet that certainly we can address your questions. Or if we need to come out to your school and talk with you one-on-one, -on -one, we're more than willing to do that as well. So with that, there's always got to be that first person. There always gotta be, and there you go. She's right at the bat. So we're going to start here on the left. So it gives you folks here on the right-hand side um, a little bit of time. So if you stand up, give your name and your school, um, and then you can ask your question. Um, hi, my name is Chase Glenn. I'm, I attend uh, the Baltimore Crossroads Center. Hi, Chase. Um, what, what type of environment would uh, eighth graders be going into when they go into high school next year? So you, like in my academics, the whole, uh, what are we walking into when we go to high school? Right, Dr. Jones can start with some of that and move yeah. and fill in. That's a big question, that's a great question. <laughs> yes, that is a really big question. A that's actually a, um, a huge transition for students as they go from eighth grade to ninth grade into high school. I would say that you're kind of entering a, a milestone in your life, um, being able to take on high school and, and kind of move to the next part of your, your career. Um, one of the things you would be um, entering, I guess, into is what we would consider to be high quality instruction, rich academics, extracurricular activities, electives, um, CTE pathways. Um, the list goes on and on um, in terms of our offerings in our, in our high schools. One of the things that we do to prepare students as they move from middle school to high school is we have a transition day or a day in which students are able to experience high school you may have already visited. Um, the high schools that you're interested in attending, but we also provide a day or um, a couple of hours where it's kind of like a day in the life of a high school student where you can, can, you can transition and ask questions and be able to get a sense of kind of where is your locker, <laughs> where are all the things, uh, where's the cafeteria, um, the gym, and just, just kind of some of those basic things that really make um, going to high school smooth and easy. But one of the things I would like for you to think about as you transition, or those of you who are transitioning from 
eighth grade to high school is really begin to think about um, ninth grade being kind of that very important year that sets the groundwork for what is to happen in 10th, 11th, and 12th grade. Um, some students come into ninth grade and we think we have a lot of time, but before you know it, as Mr. Roberts said, you're crossing that stage and graduation is here. So ninth grade is a really, really important year to get to know your counselors, to get to know um, your teachers, and to really think about that one adult that you can connect with in the building that can make sure that not only are your academic needs met, but your social emotional learning needs are met as well. Thank you for that question. And the only thing I would add to that is while you are in middle school, the other way that you can start thinking about and planning for high school is through the process of your six year plans. So some of you perhaps have already met with your school counselors one on one to talk about your six year plans. And really the purpose of that is to get you to begin thinking about what some of your goals are for when you make that transition between eighth and ninth grade, but more importantly, for as you go through high school. So that's a really good opportunity for you to sit down with someone who can make you aware of what is going to be available to you when you enter high school. But more importantly, based on what's available, how you can begin in middle school to set yourself up to have access to some of those opportunities. And so that's a great way for you to start planning for that transition while you're in middle school now. And if anyone tells you there's pools in our high school, don't believe it. Some pools. Okay. All right. Over here on the right, who's going to be brave enough to kick it off? There we go. Young lady on the my left. Yep. Perfect. You know, stand up. Your name, school. Hi. My name is Aditi Desai. I'm in sixth grade at Ridgely Middle School. Okay, welcome. I would like to ask you about what BCPS's plan is to for our environment, for um, to verify on that the air pollution in Asia. Six hundred thousand children die yearly because of air pollution. Will BCPS have have any idea how to improve on this or to help our environment? Okay. So when, when you talk about the environment, there's a couple of things. And, and especially here on the east side, a lot of our schools are built on rivers, creeks, streams, which are very environmentally sensitive, or you have streams coming through the property. So I'll address one part of that question. When we design and build new schools, so all the schools that have been built, including this one that you're in now, which is only a handful of years old, about five, six years old, you're looking at the environment is built into the school. So here's examples. In elementary schools, we have rooftop gardens. And rooftop gardens aren't just an example where kids can come out and learn to garden or learn to take care of um, of plants and so forth and provide an environment for butterflies or, or species that are transitioning through at the times of the year, but it's also a way to collect rainwater. So what these rooftop gardens do and what our roofs are literally designed to do is to collect rainwater and collect it in a way that's environmentally sustainable and in some cases even reuse and use that water. Um, but when you go into some of our newer buildings or buildings that are being redesigned and re-outfitted, even when you walk into a bathroom, you, there's environmental designs into our, even our toilets, into other areas that allow conservation of water because we know water is our most critical. You mentioned air, which is certainly um, a critical resource for obvious reasons, but our water is also a very critical resource. So when we look at environmental concerns, those are physical areas. There's other curricular areas as well. So when we look at what you're taught, so we have courses that are actually designed around environmental science. So as eighth graders, some of you may have taken environment or may be taking environmental science. We have magnet programs. So what our division of curriculum instruction does so well is provide opportunities to embed within our science curricula and other areas, opportunities for you to learn about the environment, but not just learn about the environment, how can you get involved in the environment and do your part, whether it's recycling or whether it's picking up trash or whether opportunities to volunteer or learn about ways that you can incorporate that. Um, we know we have magnet programs. Um, we have the species program at, at Sparrows Point High School. We know Sparrows Point Middle is here. So we take a lot of pride um, in that magnet opportunity, but in the day-to-day -day also environment, it's baked into what you're taught in many of the courses that you're in now and that you're gonna have when you go into high school. That's a great question. You wanna ask something? Just don't forget to use your voice around that as well. So 
in some of your schools, I know you have environmental clubs. Some of your schools are green schools and have initiatives around what that means and how you as students can become advocates in that work as well based on what you've learned and based on what you know. So I just want to encourage you to not forget your voice in that process in terms of advocacy. All right, over here. Who wants to be next? Over here. All right, come on. There we go. All right. All right. Name school? Hi, my name is Leah Ornstein. I go to Deep Creek Middle School, and okay. I want to know how you're supporting the teachers and taking back their control of their classrooms. Right. Okay. So that is a question when we talk about climate and we address the superintendents, one of her priorities is around climate. So supporting teachers in the classroom is the most important mission of a school principal, of school leadership, in making sure that teachers have an environment that is conducive to what I mentioned earlier, around your learning. So that support can come in multiple ways. Sometimes that support comes in curricular support and materials to, again, make the lesson engaging, make the lesson come to life, which, when that lesson happens and it comes to life and that teacher has the tools and the and the ability to bring that lesson and make it more and come off the paper, then that's going to address, kind of, when you say kind of take back, I think of it as make that lesson engaging, make that lesson one where the kids forget about time and they're going, oh my God, class is over because we were so engaged in this. Whether that's a lab in science kind of tied into the environmental question, or whether it's a math lesson or whether it's a social studies lesson, but there's also sometimes support could be depending on the class or depending on the structure of the school, it could be additional support in terms of, of a body, of another teacher or a co-teacher. So we have co-taught classes to provide extra supports, instructional supports for kids in classroom because again, our focus is making you prepared for life after high school and getting that diploma and having that diploma have that additional supports that are gonna allow you to succeed. So we talk sometimes about additional support with people, additional support with curricular supports, and really making sure parents are involved as well. Those are additional supports. Communication is additional support, and making sure that the school's leadership and the teachers are constantly talking with one another. If we're not talking with one another, then there's no way of knowing what is needed within the building. So we really stress with our principals, really making sure that dialogue and that door is open to make sure communication is happening so the teachers feel supported and really are support it in what they do. So that's a good question. Thank you. All right, over here. All right, we'll take this gentleman in the white shirt. Hi, I'm Peter Andrada. I'm in seventh grade and I'm from Lockraven Technical Academy. Growing up with a brother who's a sophomore in college and a sister who's a senior in high school, mm -hmm. I've already been introduced to the concept of SAT and P PSAT. Mm -hmm. And what I have noticed is that it really, it heavily influences their choices for colleges and universities. Mm -hmm. So what my question for you is, if it was possible to implement pre-PSAT courses for eighth and seventh grade. So that's a great question. Um, you are being exposed to assessments that actually are highly correlated to your success on PSAT. You probably just don't realize it. So when you take the park assessment, in language arts and in mathematics each year. What we know about that assessment is that as educators, it helps us predict how successful you may be on PSAT and on SAT because all of those exams are actually aligned to the same set of expectations for you as learners. And so when we take those expectations, starting at the SAT, those curricular expectations around literacy and mathematics, and we back map them to lower grades, the assessments that you are taking are actually ultimately aligned to getting you to that end. And so a good way for you to gauge that as an individual is to consider your performance on some of those other assessments, Park being one of them. The other way we're preparing you for that is actually through the assessments that you probably all don't like that are embedded into your units of study. So when you take your end of unit PBAs and your end of unit math assessments, our Department of Research Accountability and Assessment and our offices in curriculum and instruction have aligned those to the standards that will ultimately get you to those outcomes on SAT. So we know they're challenging and we know they're rigorous for you, 
but that's important because we've set very high expectations that will only prepare you for success on those later exams that you'll take that can sometimes be a gatekeeper to um, higher education. So great question. Um, and we have tried to align the assessments you're currently taking to help you know where you are on that trajectory leading up to those exams in high school. Thank you. Okay, over here. Up, oh, right here on the end. Hi, my name is Vivi Rupenthal and I'm from Lock Raven Academy. Um, I have a question about dress code because uh, it seems that within the school system, the dress codes vary from school to school, and um, schools that are specifically or um, more heavily influenced by African Americans seem to have a stricter dress code, whereas schools that are predominantly white have a less strict dress code. And I was wondering, how does BCPS allow this discriminatory process against, specifically against young women? So thank you for your question. Um, the issue of um, dress code, particularly with young ladies and women, actually came up when we had our conversation with the high school students and continues to come up as something that we have to um, really think about and review. We have policies and we have rules that speak to dress codes and dress code policy that should be creating a sense of consistency across our county, but we know when a county is as large as ours, there is going to be some inconsistencies but our job is to continue to work with principals and school staff to make sure that the um, consistency and the, the guidelines or the rules and policies kind of create a sense of consistency. What I will say in terms of the, um, the dress code and your feeling around it maybe being discriminatory, that is never and has never been the intent. I think what we have to do as a changing and multi um, ethnic and diverse school system is to really think about how can we review those policies in a way that kind of keeps up with some of the times, some of the cultural experiences, the backgrounds, um, and reduce gender bias in any way so that you nor other, any other student feels um, discriminated against. But we also have to think about a balance, right? So we've got to create a balance between what it means to have um, expression through clothing and through choice and also be able to honor religious practices and cultures and backgrounds, but then also minimize distractions as it relates to clothing and or um, you know, offensive kind of slogans or things like that. So we are working to really create a balance as our world, as our nation, as our county is continuing to change and become more and more diverse. I do wanna thank you for thinking about what is happening in our individual schools and your kind of um, awareness and just you know, social awareness around what we can do to make that better. Thank you. Okay, in the back, white shirt, I believe. Hi, my name is Adam Rohde. Um, I go to Spares Point Middle School. My question is, how, how can school staff reduce the amount of vaping and smoking that, that goes on in the school bathrooms? Mm -hmm. So, again, that's a, that's a multiple ap approach to that, and really all three of us can address that. We can address that from a curricular side, a teaching side in terms of health classes. So teaching you about the, the negative effects of vaping. What is and are the impacts in your body? If someone were to vape, and when they do vape, what's happening inside your body? Where does that, I don't know if you call it smoke vape or vapor go, and what happens in your body? And because it's still a relatively new phenomenon, really only the past couple of years, there's not even research out around, or really conclusive research around the, the negative effects. People know it has negative effects, but we need to know more conclusively what they are. So we teach you that. For as much as the research is coming and showing, it's our job to teach you, if this is happening, this is what's happening to your body. This is the long-term effect. This is the immediate effect. These are the things that will happen to you if you continue to do it. So there's that piece of it on one side. The other piece too is around the social aspect of it. So you see friends doing it. So you might think, well, if my friends are doing it, well, okay, I guess it's cool. Or worse, I don't want to feel left out. I don't want to feel, I feel pressured to do it. Whether that's vaping or you could insert other things, alcohol or other things um, that sh you shouldn't be doing. So how do we support you in that social aspect? How do we teach you the skills that when you see your friends vaping, 
do you have the skill set and the fortitude and the strength really to say, you know what, no. Not only is that not for me, but you shouldn't be doing that. And let me, let's, let me tell you why. That's not, it's easy for me to sit and say that to you, but it's hard for you at your age to do that. It's our job to teach you that skill set, to really build that muscle around how can I know to make the right decisions, but then how can I also help my friends or my social network to not do it as well because A, it's illegal, B, it's not appropriate, and the health consequences, short, mid, and long range, of vaping, just like smoking cigarettes or drinking alcohol. So really we attack that problem, really a problem of vaping across schools, and it's a national problem. It's not just Baltimore County, it's not just the state of Maryland. It happens in California, it happens in Hawaii, it's happening in Florida and in Alaska, and everywhere in between. So as educators and adults who are responsible for working with children, it's our job to really not just teach you the nuts and bolts consequences, but also prepare you for how to address that when you're in a social situation and you kind of find yourself pulled between wh who you think are your friends and trying to ask you to do something that's harmful versus doing what you know is the right thing to do. Um, so certainly your voice is important in that. If that is something you're seeing and something you know is happening around you, we talk about your voice. You need to have those conversations in your student government, with your peers, with your principals, with your teachers, with your advisors. And it's okay to do that. It's okay to say, hey, this is happening. How can we stop this or how can we address that? And that's why your voice, don't be silent, especially when it comes to something like vaping. Don't be silent. You know, express your concerns, express your questions to the people who are here so we can help you um, work through that. Okay. That's a great question, thank you. Yes, ma'am, up here. Hi, my name is Sibyl Lafar, and I go to Dundalk Middle School. And um, I have a question about racism. I know racism is a big thing in this world, mm -hmm. and is racism being stopped in the school, or mm -hmm. like is racism a big thing here? Okay. Yeah. Good. Mm -hmm. So that's a big question, right? Mm -hmm. That is a big question uh, around racism. What I, what I will say is that um, n n no one including the superintendent or any of her team members um, have any association with racism. It's not something that we believe in. It's not something that we support. Racism is an issue that is national and even a, a worldwide concern. What I will say is what we try to do is create awareness through our um, equity work. And what we, what we attempt to do is to make sure that outcomes are equitable for all groups of students. So we want to honor and value the diversity that makes our county so rich. Even in this room, this room is filled with a diverse group of students. Each of you have your own unique values, talents, and aspirations. And your cultural differences are to be appreciated, not tolerated, but to be appreciated. So in BCPS, we are really working with our principals to really think about equity and access and opportunity for all students. So we don't want barriers to get in the way of someone because they are a female or someone because they are um, of a different ethnicity. We want everyone to experience all the richness our county has to offer. So to answer your question, yes, racism is an issue. Is it something that's permeating our country or happening within our country? Absolutely, but here in BCPS, racism is not tolerated and it's something that we have specifically focused on through our equity work to make sure that all students, all 114,000 students, have access to equitable outcomes and high levels of instruction, academics, extracurricular activities. We don't want anything to get in the way of you all being successful. If you are coming across some situations that um, are kind of giving you some concern within your school or within our county, feel free to reach out to the adults in your building and have a conversation about that so that we can make sure that every space is an open space and accessible for all of our students. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Over here. Oh, three hands went up. All right, why don't we start with the young lady right here? Yep. Oh, well, we'll get to you next. No, no, you're fine. You can ask. We'll, we'll get to her next. It's fine. We have plenty of time. <laughs> All right, my name is Sheila Kenyan Jui. I'm a seventh grader at Ridgely Middle School. Mm -hmm. um, my question is based on technology. I know that technology mm -hmm. is required in every field that we take. Mm -hmm. And um, my question is what improvements have you all taken to position our schools in this future ready? 
plays this district in this digital age? Go ahead. So, thank you for your question. It's a great question. Um, one of our greatest uh, desires is that you are prepared for work and college and career. And so to your point, we know that you're all going to be entering careers in higher education where you will need not just to use technology, but more importantly, to use it responsibly and to use it appropriately. And so that is one of the reasons you have what we would call blended learning environments, where your learning environments are that hybrid between using technology to learn and to demonstrate your learning, while also using traditional methods of learning, paper and pencil and books, right, in order to access information and to demonstrate your learning. Because we feel that if we don't provide you with those opportunities, then we're not preparing you for how to use the technology and use it appropriately. Um, I think about my day and what I have to do on a daily basis. And I know that in my career, I have to, I, I, I'm bombarded with information and I have to sort through it and I have to sift through it. And being able to manage that and navigate it and analyze it in a timely way and do something with it is what we wanna be able to prepare you to do. And so hopefully you're seeing in your classrooms that blend of instruction where there are times where you need to access the resources that you need to learn online, where you're doing research, where you're looking at multiple sources and you're having to synthesize the information from multiple sources. But then also times where you have print resources that you have to navigate and learn how to use and learn how to annotate and learn how to comprehend so that you can act on that information as well. The last thing I'm gonna add to that is the other thing that's important to us, and hopefully you've had exposure to this through um, some of your library media courses and then also through some of the research that you're doing, is learning how to be responsible with technology and online and the importance of your digital footprint. Because again, as you enter the world of careers, that still becomes important. And so we want to expose you to um, curriculum that provides you with guidance around how to be responsible and how to be mindful of that digital pr uh, footprint that you put out there when you are engaging with technology and social media. So thank you for your question. It was a great one. Okay, back over here. Yes, young lady in the back, white sweater. Hi, my name is Carlina Tobio and I attend Sparrows Point Middle School. Okay. And I would like to know, um, how much of a say are you willing to let the students of Baltimore County have in order to make school a better place? How much say do students have? You have all the say. Um, and, and our superintendent would be the first to tell you that your voice is the first and your voice is the last. Certainly as adults, and there's a lot of adults from various parts of education and county government and, and just that certainly have a voice as well. But please never forget, you're the first and you're the last, and the power of your voice. So we shared a little bit earlier with our high school, um, with your high school colleagues and peers around how do you get your voice heard though? You may think, well, I'm one of 114,000. How can my voice be heard in this large school system or this large school that I'm in or in my community? So there's formal ways of doing that, Student Government Association, most if not all of your schools should have some type of Student Government Association. You can join that and in a real formal way have your voice heard. Many of your principals have principal advisory, student principal advisory councils where you can meet on a regular basis with your principals and share your opinions. We talked about dress codes, we talked about technology, where you can sit with your principal or sit with your assistant principal or your teachers and share, these are our thoughts at 13 years old, this is what we think how technology should be used or the dress code should be and what we want for our school and have that conversation. The superintendent hears from students all the time. Um, the superintendent, when she's visiting your schools and you see her, go up to her. You go up to her and you talk to her and you have that conversation about any of the ideas that you have. She wants to hear from you all the time. And I've said that probably 20 times already and I'll probably say it another 20 times. She wants to hear from you. So whether you see her in your school, whether you email her, whether you write her a letter, you send her an email, or you, or you see her at any other occasion, let her know how you feel. Let us know. 
um, because your voice is critical. You have a student board member, a new student member of the board who was elected last week. Um, so Amar Rashid um, is going to be your student member of the board. He has a huge presence on social media. So whatever social media platform you use, um, you will find him on that. He invites all of you to message him, to reach out to him, because he's your voice on the Board of Education. He's a voting member on the Board of Education. That's a powerful and hugely responsible position. So reach out to him, let him know, because we feel it's that important. As a community, as Baltimore County Public Schools, we feel your voice is so important that there's a student who sits on the Board of Education. So really, that's the di real, one direct answer to your question. That's how important we feel your voice is. But on a more day-to-day -day basis, there's a lot of ways for you guys to have your voice heard. So please take advantage of those. So thank you. All right, well, I'm going to come back to, yep, in the brown and white striped. So just stand up. Yep, and she'll see you. There we go. Hi, um, my name is Rose DeGataluri. I'm a student at Dumbarton Middle School. Um, I have seen and personally been in situations where students are afraid to ask questions to teachers for fear of being yelled at or criticized by teachers or peers. So what can be done so that we can support students to ask the questions that they need to ask? Okay, you want to sit here? Go ahead, you want to take that? Oh, oh. so we never want any student to be afraid to ask questions because that's what we're in school for. We're in school to ask questions, we're in school to learn. And keep in mind that even though we are the educators, your questions inform our work, right? The questions that you have inform our work. They get us thinking, they get us to be able to plan moving forward. I guess if you're ever in a space where you feel like you, um, you cannot ask questions within that particular setting, it's, it's important, back to what Mr. Roberts said, it's important to have that one adult in the building or someone in the building that is going to listen. Every school has someone in their building who is going to listen. Um, you can start off with your counselor. You can ask to see your counselor and ask questions. If you're not able to ask questions with your counselor, like Mr. Roberts said, there are student um, voice platforms that can be um, used to ask questions. I think the other thing to keep in mind too is that we are, um, we are a county that believes in if you see something, you should say something. We also, again, believe in the power of your, of your voice. So if you're ever feeling that you have questions that you want to ask in terms of a social emotional space. We have counselors, we have PPWs, we have social workers, psychologists, many, many people in the building to go to. It can also start with too, you know, having, sharing your thoughts with your parent and having your parent bring that concern back to the school and share it with the administration. But we never want anyone to feel like they're in a space where they cannot answer questions. And that honestly, that is not kind of like the norm that may be more of an isolated situation because most teachers do embrace the fact that learning is a two-way street, right? If I ask a question, then you can answer it, but your answer then informs, again, again my work. And we want you all to know that we don't want you to just come to school and kind of just not, you know, turn your brains on high. We really want to hear from you because we think that your questions are rich questions. There's a lot that you all know that we had no idea about at your age, and we're learning so much from you each and every day. So whether it's your teacher, whether it's your assistant principal, principal, counselor, anyone in that building that you feel like you can connect with, ask those questions. And if you feel like um, you still need to kind of involve a parent or someone like that, do that because we want to make sure that you feel, you feel heard and you feel valued. Thank you very much. All right, back over here. Um, this in the pink and gray, I think, you want to stand up? Um, hi, I'm Ahalet from Dumbarton right Middle School, and I was wondering, how do you think the Alice drill can be improved? All right, so Alice, so for those of you who don't know, Alice is our active response um, to a threat inside the building. Um, so if you remember even, and it's new this year in terms of implementing it, so you've been practicing every month an Alice drill, some variation of an Alice drill, whether you're in the cafeteria for one or some other variation that you go through within your school. If you remember even to last year when we had code reds or we had to lock down and you drew the blinds and you sat down quietly against the wall and everyone was quiet and drawing the blinds, well that was a response okay, that school systems across the nation use in terms of an active assailant, someone who was coming in the building to do harm to, to anyone in the building, the adults or the children within the building. But what the research has shown and what the study of active shooters and, and active assailants within a building has shown is that choice is the powerful part of that. Um, so so to, to your question, we have Alice now because what the research is showing 
is that you as children and as teachers, as adults, once you get information, so the I analysis informed, so once you are informed of what's happening within your building, then you and your teachers make an informed decision. That informed decision may be drawing the blinds, closing the door, securing the door to make sure no one can barricading the door, all of those things, and then sitting there and waiting for first responders to come. Or that informed decision may be because the threat may be on one side of the building and you're on the other side to leave the space that you're in and go outside. So that is what Alice is really at the heart of Alice, is making sure that based on the information that you have, that you can make a decision that will save your life, that will get you home to your family and to your house in the exact same way that you came to school that afternoon or earlier that morning and that day. And then all the procedures that come after that. So that's why the system really in a, in a short way has gone to Alice is because that's what the research is showing, it saves lives and that's what it's about. If nothing else, it's about saving your life and saving lives of everyone who works and learns in our schools. So thank you for asking that. And we certainly would welcome your feedback as you continue to go through the Alice drills. Again, another opportunity to offer feedback to your school principal or to your staff about how did that drill go. Um, so we definitely welcome that. All right, over here, we had a couple. Okay, I'm gonna go to this gentleman here. Just stand up so they know where to bring the mic. There we go. Oh, okay. Uh, hi, my name is Terry Mitchell and I attend Lock Raven Technical okay. Academy. Um, one of the biggest issues at our school is social media threats and um, as a student uh, and the students in the school that don't know how to handle the situation mm -hmm. so um, how would you handle the situation and what are ways we can do to improve our school so I can start go for it. Um, great question thank you so we are seeing increases of those threats on social media uh, the most important thing that I want you all to know is that as soon as we are alerted to those instances, there's an entire team of people uh, behind the scenes that are actually investigating that situation in order to be able to make the best informed decisions around that. One of the, one of the issues with that is how fast information travels, right? So when you see something on your phone in the morning and then you notify a friend that you have seen that, right? What happens? It begins to spread quite quickly. And when we're working with our partners in law enforcement, we have to try to determine the origin so we can determine whether or not it's credible. And so one thing I would ask all of you to do is when these things do occur, the best way to handle it is to inform the adult that you've seen it and then stop passing it. Because the more you pass it, the further the information gets away from the originator of that information and the more complex it becomes to investigate it. So make sure when something happens, you see something on your phone, it goes back to what Dr. Jones said about see something, say something, that you're immediately notifying an adult. We share with your school administration ways you can do that if you're not in school when that occurs. So if you're at home and you see something, there are ways for you to contact the proper personnel so that we can begin investigating it. But we are able to very quickly, um, through a team of people, determine the credibility of such threats and then make the best informed decision around them to ensure that you are safe. Thank you. So we have time for probably one more question over here. So I know we've heard a lot from, and we love our friends at Lock Raven and Dumbarton and Sparrows Point Middle, <laughs> but um, any school that hasn't asked a question from, one, okay, so right here in the front. Hi, I'm Corey Taylor, I'm in the eighth grade. I'm from Golden Ring. My mm -hmm. question is how do BCPS plan to help with the mental illness of students like anxiety, or depression. Sure, mental health. Okay. Dr. Jones. That's a really good. That's a really good question, Corey. And so, um, now that we know that um, some of our students and some of our families and our communities are struggling with um, mental health, illness, and or issues, what we've tried to do, of course, with the support of our superintendent, is really think about how we can have more people in our schools who have expertise in those areas. So we are advocating for support personnel such as social workers, psychologists, and counselors 
who can provide students, families, and communities with the supports that are needed to address those issues. Um, our PPWs are in place as liaisons between the school and the communities to really be able to connect our families to some of those community agencies that are helping us to address the issue. What I will say is if there are any concerns um, within your schools around um, mental illness or mental, um, mental health issues, it's very important to start off by telling someone about it and then making sure that they connect you to those resources. Like I said, we have counselors, we have social workers. We're even engaging our health professionals to be able to address those issues within our schools. Thank you for your question. All right, so I have one more. This young lady right here. All right. Hi my, oh, hi, my name is Victoria Solorzano. I go to Stemmers Run Middle School. And along with school climate, since there are many, there's a variety and diverse amount of students in our schools, and many of them who don't speak English, who that's not their first language, or their parents don't speak English, are there anything we can do in order to help them, you know, like their parents, if they want to help their students who, I mean their kids, who, um, who may be struggling in school due to that fact? So thank you for your question. Um, we do have offices who support our families where English is not their first language. Um, one of the things I think that we need to help you do as students is understand what those resources are and to help your families understand those as well. And so we do have when um, students are enrolling in school through our welcome centers, we do connect our families with resources in the community and within our schools. But then there are ways within the school that you can advocate um, for yourself as an English learner or for your families if, you're, if English is not their first language. So for example, if we have families who need to access a teacher or a counselor or an administrator and English is not their first language, we have resources such as Language Line where we can um, use a service and get immediate translations for parents so that they can communicate with the school and so I can talk to you a little bit more about that later but I think the important thing is that you know what those resources are thanks so with that we've come to the end of our time with you again on behalf of our superintendent mrs. white thank you so much yeah. to you for coming out um, on this beautiful afternoon and sharing your questions and thoughts with us again thank you to the staff that joined our students this afternoon have a great afternoon <laughs>